Good evening, everybody. Um, welcome Local 509 members. Welcome members of our community. I wanna welcome everyone to uh, our SEIU Local 509 COVID vaccine town hall. We are looking forward to this evening uh, to have an hour of uh, discussion about uh, the COVID vaccine, answer your questions. Um, I am Peter McKinnon. I'm the president of SEIU Local 509. Uh, we are a, human, a, a union of human service workers and our members have been on the front lines throughout this pandemic. And we see this as a moment where we can look ahead with hope. The vaccine is a huge turning point. We're grateful for the medical, medical professionals who helped us get here. This will be a space for our union members and other community members to learn more about the vaccine and the protections it can provide, can provide us all. And I just wanna say as a reminder tonight, even though this is a union sponsored event, we won't be addressing workplace specific issues related to the vaccine. We will for our members, of course, and answer any questions that our members have about the vaccine and their workplace. But we wanted this forum to be a place to help folks understand uh, better the science and the medicine behind the vaccines. We'll be looking for local 509 members uh, to have forums like this in the future. So stay tuned for that and be sure to talk to your steward or chapter officer if you have workplace specific questions. And then lastly, the information that, we're provide, that will be provided tonight by our panel of experts uh, it is important and informative, but it is critically important to remember that any decisions that you make about the vaccine should be discussed with yourself and your medical professionals. And that's a decision that only you and your team uh, can provide. I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Orlando Pena who is our private sector chapter president and group home worker. And he's gonna move us along, Orlando. Oh, thank you, Peter. And hey, y'all, my name is Orlando Pena. I'm, as Peter said, I'm the private sector chapter president here at Local 509. I'm a group home worker um, at a group home here in, in uh, Peabody, Massachusetts. I live in Lynn. Um, but after a year that was full of tragedies and challenges for everyone, um, we're bringing folks, folks together to learn about uh, the vaccine and how they can get protected. Um, I'm especially excited to share that I was recently vaccinated Monday, actually. Um, I'm feeling great physically, a um, little soreness after the vaccine, that's normal, but I'm um, feeling great physically and more importantly, more importantly, emotionally. It's been a huge relief and it's given me, you know, a ton of peace of mind. Um, and I got vaccinated because, you know, I, I've seen the impact it's had on the community and on my, on my own family, my in-laws, um, people around me, my coworkers who are essential workers working on the front lines throughout this entire pandemic. I've seen people, you know, get really, really sick and pass away, you know, and this, this virus has, you know, disproportionately affected communities of color, black and Latino folks like myself, um, unfortunately, uh, and so many of us are front on the front lines and we need to be protected um, so we can keep our loved ones safe. We come home every single day, we work hard. And, you know, unfortunately some of us are bringing this, this thing home with us. Um, you know, we wanna keep our coworkers safe. We wanna keep our clients that we serve safe um, and, and ourselves. Um, you know, the pandemic is nowhere near over but I'm really excited to be uh, vaccinated and excited for, to see the, you know, the light at the end of the tunnel. Um, and I'm excited that the, that the vaccine will be accessible to everyone, you know, coming soon. Um, so we have a, we have a panel of experts here to talk to you all. Um, I'm not, I'm not an expert. <laughs> so I'm going to introduce, uh, Dr. Paul Bittinger. He's doc, uh, he's a chief division of emergency preparedness at MGH, Massachusetts General Hospital. He's also the director of MGH Center for Disaster Medicine, uh, Disaster Medicine and chairman of the Massachusetts COVID-19 Vaccine Advisory Group. Also joining us tonight is Dr. Paulette Chandler. She is the uh, lead commu of community engagement and education for the COVID-19 Moderna vaccine trials, and also an associate physician and epidemiologist at Brigham and Women's Hospital. Also, we'll have Dr. Julie Levison, um, she's a co-director at MGH Chelsea Healthcare Center, a uh, community research program. She's also an assistant professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School. Uh, also on our panel, Dr. Natalia Linos. She is the executive director of the 
FXB Center for Health and Human Rights at Harvard University and member of the COVID-19 Health Justice Advisory Committee to the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival. Also, Dr. John Santiago he is, is on. He, uh, he's the ER medicine at, uh, he works in the ER medicine at Boston Medical Center. He's a state rep for the 9th Suffolk uh, and captain of the U.S. Army Reserve. And an SEIU member with the communities of interns and residents. So welcome. Welcome oh, to yes. our panel. Yeah. I want to thank you all. Uh, each of our panel, we're going to take a couple minutes to just uh, speak a little bit about the vaccine, then we're going to go into Q&A. On your, uh, those who are participating, uh, there's a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. We encourage people to put questions into that Q&A. We'll be answering them throughout the, uh, throughout the hour. And for 509 members, we had uh, previously sent out information and asked folks to send us their questions. So we already have a series of questions that our members have asked that we'll be uh, presenting to the panel. Um, so with that, I'll turn it to Dr. Binner, Binner to uh, start us off. Great, uh, thank you so very much. Uh, it's, it's my pleasure uh, to be able to join you. Um, and um, I uh, really, it's an, it's an honor uh, to, to uh, join such an incredible group of, of workers who do so very much uh, for the community. Um, as was mentioned, uh, I am an emergency physician uh, and like Orlando, uh, I have also been vaccinated. In fact, uh, uh, I've actually received my second dose of vaccine as of uh, last week uh, and I am similarly feeling uh, very, very good uh, and, and grateful for the opportunity. Um, I'll just uh, set this in context uh, with all the other speakers about um, uh, where uh, allocation of the vaccine is from the state's perspective uh, and where we're headed. Um, the vaccine, unfortunately, is in limited supply as, as a new therapeutic, and all of us who are involved in vaccination wish we had enough uh, for everyone on day one um, because it's that important. It's what's going to help us get on the other side of this pandemic. Uh, but uh, we are manufacturing as quickly as we can, but don't yet have enough. The National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine, which is an academic group, thought about how to prioritize uh, the allocation of vaccine, as did the Center for Disease Control uh, in the U.S. government, uh, and a group they have uh, that advises them on immunization. All of these groups agree that frontline healthcare workers, uh, which includes yourselves, uh, should be prioritized because of the essential services we provide and how we maintain health across uh, society and, and across, um, uh, um, across uh, our communities. So in Massachusetts, uh, vaccine allocation is divided into three phases. The first phase includes healthcare workers, uh, essential frontline first responders, such as fire and police and EMS, residents of long-term care facilities who we know and you know uh, have been hit so hard uh, by this, uh, by this uh, illness, and home health uh, attendants. Um, and, and again, that, that prioritization in phase one reflects the importance of the work uh, that each of us does to keep patients and keep our, our communities healthy. Phase two, which is the next phase, uh, includes uh, high-risk individuals, um, including uh, the elderly and those with comorbid conditions, as well as other critical workers uh, in the community. And the third phase is, is the general public. So right now, Massachusetts is in phase one, uh, and so that's why Orlando and I and others on this panel uh, are eligible for vaccine and have received uh, vaccine, and why we're so excited to be able to talk to you about your questions and thoughts uh, about vaccination. Um, and the goal uh, of the Commonwealth is to get through this phase as quickly as possible uh, to get to high-risk patients uh, who clearly also uh, very much need vaccine uh, to be administered. Um, it will probably be in the next month, uh, by meaning by the beginning of February, that we expect uh, to be able to move forward with high-risk patients. Um, and it probably will take a couple of months to get through that uh, group of high-risk patients that have been specified and the critical workers uh, before we can get to the general public. So um, there's lots in the press. There's lots that's changing. This is a, a dynamic situation. And certainly, uh, if we're fortunate enough to have more supply, we will speed up even faster. Uh, but that's where we are uh, right now. Um, and so um, unless I'm uh, incorrect, I believe Dr. Levison uh, is the next speaker. And so let me hand it over to her. Dr. Levison. Thank you, Dr. Bittinger. And again, um, 
tremendous amount of gratitude for the invitation. Muchísimas gracias por la invitación. I'm an infectious diseases physician at MGH Chelsea and also work very closely with congregate care settings and group homes. So I'm, I have tremendous gratitude for all that you do. Um, I got my COVID vaccine a week ago, had minor muscle pain that lasted about a day and a half with very minor and I'm scheduled to get the second dose. Um, it's about like getting a flu shot. I wanted to talk really briefly about um, what we know in terms of how the vaccines that we currently have on market, Pfizer and uh, Moderna vaccines, these are called mRNA vaccines. So I thought I'd talk a little bit about what we know because since we're still early in the vaccines, we should know what we know and what we don't know and be clear about that. And we'll hopefully be coming back to you and, and educating you all about what we learn and also learning from your questions. So vaccines just really briefly are the cornerstone of infectious disease prevention. And many of you have probably get vaccines every year for influenza or preventing pneumonia like pneumococcal pneumonia or hepatitis B or human papillomavirus infection for, for children or whooping cough. And these are the cornerstones. In fact, smallpox was eradicated through um, vaccine and measles has essentially been controlled except when our levels of immunization go down. So we know vaccines can work. So what does this really mean for COVID-19? There are two vaccines on the market. Dr. Chandler will talk a little bit more. She's been critically involved in the Moderna trial. The vaccines that are currently on offer are called mRNA vaccines. What does that mean? Really basically what it is is a piece of genetic code Think of it like a puzzle piece. And it gets introduced into the arm, into the muscle through an injection. And that puzzle piece, that genetic code or mRNA gets into the cell. And the cell, which is a building block in the body uses the already existing machinery that's there to produce a message that goes out on the outside of the cell and it's like a license plate. And that message says to the body, it's time to respond to infection. And it's a very specific response to COVID-19. What's really mir miraculous about that is the body never sees COVID-19 infection to produce this immune response. It's just a very tiny part of that puzzle piece of that virus, it's very specific. It never gets introduced into your genetic material. It is quick and then gets degraded so it doesn't last. So those are important questions that come up when people are concerned. Does it cause any changes in my body, in my genetic material? No, it doesn't get introduced into the nucleus. What do we know? So we know data from three months of the trial. So there were early trial, phase one, phase two, then phase three, large study, more than 30,000 people, 44,000 people in the Pfizer study. And the um, outcomes were so far pretty miraculous for um, the three months of observation. Uh, the primary endpoint that the trials looked at were clinical disease. So symptomatic COVID-19, 95% effective in the Pfizer study, 94.1% in the Moderna study. So basically essentially the same. And then also some of you may be thinking, what about individuals who are obese? or diabetes, also excellent outcomes so far that we think very similar to the general population. From what we know, these are um, very safe, no significant severe allergies in the trial. Um, things to know about are things like Orlando and Dr. Bittinger and I talked about muscle pain, um, maybe some joint aches, maybe feeling temperature, even fever is rare. Um, and there are, and I'm happy to talk a little bit more in the Q&A about questions about allergies, but so far um, we know um, that these are very safe and very effective. They require two doses. So but depending on whether you get Pfizer or Moderna, Moderna it's a, between a 21 and a 28 day gap between the first and the second dose. So I'll end there and happy to answer questions later on. Okay, thank you, Dr. Levison. Uh, next up, uh, Dr. Chandler. So I'll just um, follow along with the diversity that was included in these trials because people often ask, 
were people included that look like me that have my conditions. And we were very intentional, at least for the Moderna and for the Pfizer and for all the vaccine trials, they're being very intentional about making sure that we include populations that are at increased risk for ex being exposed to the virus and increased risk for having severe complications from infection. So for the Moderna trial, we had about 10% of um, Blacks and about 25% Latinx community, about 20, 30% people over age 65, because we know big risk factors for ex exposure to the infection include being a person of color, as well as being an age is the big risk factor for severity of infection. And the, for the outcomes that were already been shared, the efficacy, meaning how well does this vaccine prevent transmission of infection and complications from infection once um, symptomatic, you know, developing symptomatic infection, as well as severe complications, 95% for Moderna, I mean, for Pfizer, and 94% for Moderna. And this was, these outcomes were similar among age, race, and the, um, you know, elderly populations. We, of course, it, some people say, well, couldn't you have done better in terms of having people of color represented? We, of course, we always want to have a greater representation, but we were happy that we achieved what we did in the backdrop of this clinical trial. George Floyd's death, Breonna Taylor, and the list goes on in terms of um, suspicion for communities of color to participate in this type of trial. The benefit of getting the vaccine. I've had my vaccine also, just had a sore arm, no significant other side effects, no fever, headache, although those are potential side effects from the vaccine, is that we have the opportunity to make a difference in our community because we know that one, when we're vaccinated, we help reduce the spread of infection to those because you know 40 to 50% of people are asymptomatic when they have this virus so they can be spreading this virus without even knowing that they are spreading the virus. Now, some of my friends who do work at assisted um, living facilities or in um, transitional housing, one person in particular told me, you know, we have the vaccine available for our staff to be vaccinated, but only three out of 23 people have been vaccinated. So there is still great hesitancy even with these great outcomes, because of course, we do not know the long-term side effects of these vaccines because they have not been studied for you know, many years. And then others say, well, I'm thinking about getting pregnant, so I don't wanna risk complications. We do have limited data. Some people did get pregnant while they were enrolled in the vaccine trial. And so far there have not been any pregnancy complications, but that was not an endpoint for the trial. And I'll, and with that, and move to the next person. Great, thank you. And I want to remind uh, folks who are participating, there's a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. I see people putting questions in there. Please put them in. We're going to get to the Q&A momentarily. Uh, next up, uh, Dr. Linos is going to speak for a few minutes. Thank you so much for having me. And as the only non-medical doctor, I have not been offered the vaccine. And I'm a social epidemiologist who studies disease distribution and really has been looking at COVID from a social determinants uh, perspective, looking at the inequities that we are seeing play out, inequities that unfortunately, many people who are social epidemiologists like myself predicted. We could have predicted it in March. We knew it was gonna play out worse for communities of color. And I wanna be clear right now that this isn't because of race, it's because of racism and the way that our societies are structured. And talking onto what Dr. Chandler said, it is important to talk about the hesitancy, but acknowledge it, that it is rooted in reality. The medical system, the public health system has a history and has ongoing problems with racism. So it is not unfounded that people are worried, but it is so important to recognize that this is one unique chance for all of us to get vaccinated. And it does, uh, you know, it's safe. I trust the doctors on this call who know the intricate details. And when it's offered to me, I will take it as soon as it's offered to me. But let me talk a little bit about why, as Dr. Bittinger said, we have limited supply. So we need to prioritize people and why the prioritization comes that, you know, you are, are coming first, but then we're thinking about older age and how we wanna think about race and ethnicity. It's not 
experimentation. I have heard from some communities saying, well, you know, you're going to offer it to us first because you want to experiment on us. This isn't a trial. The trial is over. Dr. Chandler, you know, it's done. Now we are in the real phase where we're giving people a chance to protect themselves uh, from having serious complications and to protect their families and their communities. So while I think today is a great opportunity to listen, to ask the questions, this is ongoing and it is okay to have many, many questions. And it's the responsibility of, you know, everyone around you, your doctor to, to answer those. From my perspective though, equity has to be front and center. We are living a reality where the impact of COVID has hit some communities harder and younger ages. You know, as we talk about the general public population getting it and people above the age of 75 or 65, it is important to know that American Indians, Latinx and black Americans are dying at younger ages too. So the protection that maybe some white Americans have to say, you know, I'm 35 or I'm 45 or I'm 55, you know, that isn't the same. So age and, and sort of exposure intersect here. So I'm happy to answer any questions, but I wanna say that I hope that many of you will get some answers today ask the questions, and I hope you will uh, accept the vaccine because it is one, it's not a silver bullet because as a social epidemiologist, we know that our conditions in housing, our workplaces um, you know, are also important. So we will have to continue wearing masks, socially distancing. And lastly, I wanna say for everyone on this call that who say things like, you know, I'm being evicted. I don't have time to think, you know, not that you would be, but you know, people in your neighborhood or your community have to think about more critical issues putting food on the table. Yes, those are still important and still call on your politicians. And I'm glad that um, you know, Representative Santiago gets to have that double hat to speak to us because it is important to, to keep pushing for equity and structural change. This isn't a silver bullet. Thank you, Dr. Linos and uh, Dr. Santiago. Uh, and then we'll open up, we'll do the question and answer. Great, thank you, Peter. Um, and thank you, Orlando, for hosting the event. And thank you to my brothers and sisters on 509. As a former SEIU member, I have tremendous respect for what you do uh, on the front lines. Um, I've been advocating you for you since day one on Beacon Hill. And I will continue to do so because I think what you bring to the table, the values that you uh, work with and uh, represent, um, I couldn't be more proud to call you uh, a, a fellow fighter in this uh, pandemic. Listen, uh, we are quite literally in the fight of our lives. I mean, this pandemic has ravaged not just our public health care system, um, but um, the economy you know, writ large. And it's so important to really understand what Dr. Linus was saying. You know, the vaccination plays an incredibly important piece in getting us back to what the pre-pandemic life was. But if we don't really address these underlying um, social determinants of health that she was referring to, whether it's housing, um, you know, transportation, economic and educational opportunity, uh, we're not gonna get where we need to be, right? So it's important to think about what this year looks like and how we roll out this vaccine. But I'm more worried about what this post-pandemic recovery looks like and make sure, making sure that's rooted in equity. Uh, but until we get there, we need to get each and every one of you vaccinated. In my experience as an ER physician, so I've been on the front lines with you every weekend, um, you know, over the past 10 months, uh, there was a place where I got deployed for four months after the first surge. And quite literally, you know, as a frontline provider on the first surge, uh, we had quite literally no idea what was going on. It was scary. It was difficult. Um, there are a lot of questions left unanswered. And if you think about the beginning, we were told to intubate early, you know, try drugs like hydroxychloroquine, stay away from steroids. And as we've, you know, learned a lot more about the disease and that we've, we've tested certain hypotheses, the second surge, we have a better idea how to treat this. And so I say that because, you know, I believe in science. I believe in medicine. And I think you should too. Um, and that's what this vaccine is about. It's a, it's a vaccine that's been thoroughly tested. Um, thousands and thousands, tens of thousands of people across this country. And, and it's, it's proven to, be, to work. And over the course of these past 10 months, has uh, things have gotten more critical in the hospital. You know, I'm working tomorrow night. Um, infections have picked up. Hospitalizations have picked up. But there's no doubt that the idea that the vaccine is available to us um, has given us quite literally and figuratively a shot in the arm to keep it going. And you know, my hope is that over the coming six, seven, eight, nine months, as we get people vaccinated, as we get to a place of herd immunity, um, that we'll be able to beat this virus and then to be able to tackle these social determinants of health. So I got my shot. You know, I flew back from deployment on the 15th. I got my first shot on the 16th. And I just had a sore arm. I got my second shot just a couple of days ago. 
And aside from, in addition to the sore arm, I was, had some chills. The chills lasted about four or five hours. I took some Tylenol, some Advil, and it's a common thing. I mean, when I get the flu shot, I also get my chills. Uh, my arm was sore for a day or two. I can tell you it wasn't as sore when I got my anthrax shot. My, my arm was sore for about four or five days. Uh, but it's a critically important that people like yourself, people of color, you know, um, are taking this vaccine. And, and rest assured that has a elected official, has a physician, but more importantly, as a person of color, that I'm going to be out there advocating and making sure that our folks, our communities are educated and uh, more than willing to take this virus. Because I understand that there's a lot of hesitancy with respect to black and brown communities and, and their concern over the healthcare system, and, and rightly so, given our country's history. But right now is a consequential period in our nation's history, and we, we need that vaccine and we need you to take it. Great, thank you so much uh, to the panel. Now we're gonna open up for our question and answer again at the bottom of your screen. Um, please put in your, your questions and we'll get some answers. Uh, the first uh, question that we have come up is for Dr. Chandler or Dr. Levison, uh, whoever may be better to answer, but what's the difference between the Moderna vaccine and the Pfizer vaccine? I can start. So the Moderna Vax, they're both messenger RNA vaccines. The dosing interval is different. One is given at day one, day 21. The other one is given at day one, day 29. The um, efficacy app or the effectiveness in preventing um, infection or transmission of infection, severe disease, probably about the same for both, 95% versus 94%. The ingredients are similar and the side effect profile is similar, meaning, you know, muscle aches, fever, headaches, soreness. Moderna, some people know adenopathy in the, um, or lymph node enlargement and the arm where it's injected, which has not really been seen a lot with the Pfizer vaccine. But in general, they are pretty similar, except for the dosing interval and of course, the um, one seems to provide greater um, response in a shorter period of time, which is the Pfizer. I would just briefly to add on what Dr. Chandler said is the, the age of inclusion in the, in the trials and who are currently approved, which age group. So the Pfizer group is approved for individuals ages 16 and above where Moderna is ages 18 and above, and Moderna has started testing the vaccine in individuals aged 12 to 17. So just a little bit of difference for adolescents. Thank you for that. And then the next question is for Dr. Bittinger Levinson. Um, the question is, why do vaccines have to come in two doses? Uh, could a single dose vaccine be coming in the future? So, um, you know, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine is a single dose. Um, why is it important? So the trials of Pfizer and Moderna, which we mentioned it required two doses, were really designed to look at how effective they were after two doses. So there's, we have less information on people who had one dose, but what we do know from that is the effectiveness after one dose in the Pfizer trial was 50 about 52% and in the Moderna trial, 80%. So good. Um, I think people, before we even know how, knew how effective the mRNA vaccines were, we were hoping for 50 or 60 or 70%. Um, but the evidence so far after three months of data suggests 95% effectiveness after two doses. And that's what the FDA, which is the national body that's been monitoring for safety and effectiveness have approved for two doses. And, and, and I would just add that it's, it's common for several different kinds of vaccines if it's a new vaccine to need a second dose. Uh, um, and so it's not out of line with what we know about a lot of other effective vaccines. There is one uh, vaccine that's in development that may come later uh, that only needs one dose, but it's, it's because it's a different kind of vaccine. So really the most important thing is to follow the instructions as, as with really any medicine, um, that if it's recommended for two doses to get effect, um, that's what we will recommend. That's uh, what I did to get my second shot. Um, if indeed we get another one that may be coming from Johnson & Johnson that only needs one, uh, one dose, uh, you know, we'll, we'll evaluate that when the science comes out. Great, thank you. Uh, the next question that we have is uh, Dr. Binder uh, can probably answer best. How did the state determine or 
is the state determine, uh, determining who qualifies for the vaccine in, in which phase? Sure. So I think that's a really important question. Uh, as I had uh, mentioned a little bit before, um, people have been really trying to think about this uh, for months now. Um, a group of very thoughtful uh, scientists, academics, others uh, came up with a, an initial plan from, again, what was called the National Academies. Uh, and they very much uh, put together a, a set of values of saving lives, promoting health equity and uh, addressing health disparities. Um, and that was really the beginning foundation. Then an independent group uh, that works uh, for works with the CDC, but is an independent group of experts called the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practice, uh, refined that list with a, an additional uh, change to the set of recommendations. Um, so those two groups provided the foundation. And then here in Massachusetts, uh, there is an advisory committee uh, that advises the governor and the state uh, on recommendations taking that data, but ultimately it's the state that decides uh, uh, how to allocate vaccine. Um, all of the groups are in alignment. There's no difference uh, in recommending healthcare workers uh, and those who support home-based care uh, and long-term care, congregate care settings uh, are all recommended uh, in the top priority. Um, there is uh, some divergence uh, after that. Uh, and some of you may have seen there have been some other uh, uh, announcements recently about age criteria and others uh, from the federal government. I would expect there may be some additional changes uh, that can be talked about or that you may see between states. But right now, in terms of the top tiers, the residents of long-term care facilities and those who provide health care uh, are, are pretty much uh, universally agreed to be at the tops of the list. And the next question is for Dr. Santiago. Um, can you just talk about uh, the reactions to the vaccine, the allergic reactions to the vaccine and, um, and the risks for that, and what kind of treatment would someone receive if they did uh, have an allergic reaction? Uh, so it's my understanding that on par with many vaccines that we take, that there are reactions. Let's face it, I mean, as a physician in the hospital, one of the first things I do when I see any patient is I look at their allergies and I see what they are. And you'd be surprised, people have allergies to everything, things as simple as you know, Advil, Tylenol, you, know, you name it, all kinds of food. And so it's not uncommon to have allergies to a whole host of different treatments, medications, and foods. And so on par with similar uh, vaccines, you know, you can get uh, side effects from this. And as Dr. Chandler was saying, the vast majority of them are things like, you know, headache, chills, you know, you, you know fever. Um, and that's what I got. I got chills the second time. Now we do know per the studies that you're more likely to get these secondary these side effects with the second dose. And again, that was the case in my case. After I had the first shot, my arm was sore. With the second shot, my arm was sore plus I had chills. Now there is this concern that you know some patients have developed something called anaphylaxis, a severe allergic reaction. And again, that happens in all kinds of treatments. And there have been a couple of cases of those. And that's why we recommend that after you get the vaccination, that there's a period where they watch you, you know, for at least 15 minutes. If you have a history of severe allergies, to watch you at least 30 minutes. Now, if you were to develop a severe reaction to the vaccine, it's something that you know, we'd be able to treat um, just like any other allergic reaction. And again, this is very rare and um, something that has been reported in the media, but it's not something to, you know, as a physician, when I see that, it's like, okay, you know, someone's having a severe allergic reaction, just like they would with, you know, a whole host of things. So you'll, no doubt, you'll see it in the media and you'll see these case reports you know, one-offs here and there. But let me just say that the physicians and the nurses and the hospitals are more than able and prepared to address the situation at hand. And that's why they're gonna watch you for at least 15 minutes after you get the shot. Great, thank you. Uh, next question, uh, Dr. Levison or Dr. Chandler. Uh, will the vaccine prevent people from getting COVID and can you still spread it even after you've been vaccinated? So the, the primary outcome for the clinical trial was symptomatic COVID disease. So the trials weren't really set up to look at transmission. So what we know so far is we, we, we don't know anything yet about transmission. And that's why we say that it's important to still do all the basics that we know work. And that's hand washing, wearing a mask, keeping our distance and staying home when you feel ill. The Moderna trial in a small sample did take no swabs, 
or maybe, I don't know, Dr. Chandler, if you want to mention that because you were doing right. Yeah, so no swabs would suggest it that there is also redu reduced um, carriage in the vi of the virus in the nose. So which would go along with possible reduced transmission too. So we'll see, um, of course, we'll be able to capture that more as more people are vaccinated and as we follow these individuals out because even though they've received their two doses, people that participate in the trial will continue to be followed for two, two years. And they'll get blood work, they'll um, get all sorts of testing. So that will provide more information on transmission too. This question is for Dr. Linos. Um, we know communities of color are disproportionately impacted by COVID. Um, we know their health incomes are impacted by implicit bias in the medical system. How can we trust and help ensure that the vaccine will be distributed equitably? That's a great question. And it's really important to not hide behind the history, you know, talking about uh, Tuskegee, recognizing that this isn't, you know, a one off event. And it was sponsored by the US Public Health Service. It was a government, it was institutional racism that played out over decades. Um, and it's not just one instance, you know, forced sterilization of women has happened for brown and black women and continues to happen, you know, so there is a lot to be weary about. Having said that, I think we can call on people like Dr. Bittinger, Representative Santiago to make the right choices, to put equity at the center of the vaccine rollout. And as long as we're advocating for that, as long as we are saying, we will not allow for this to play out in a way that is, you know, that this distribution is not fair. Um, that's really important. But let me explain something that if somebody says to you, no, I don't want it right now, it is your responsibility as an institution to figure out why and to work really hard with community leaders. And in the Poor People's Campaign, you know, is led by Reverend Barber. I think faith-based communities, other leaders, it might be, um, you know, doctors of color. I'm so happy that this panel has them who will become spokespeople. You have to figure out who is the more trusted person, who is the more trusted messenger and listen, listen hard. So we're not going to get there overnight, but we can't give up just because a few people say, you know, I'd rather wait a few weeks. So this is a call maybe to Dr. Bittinger to say, you know, if somebody says, I'm not willing to take it now, but can I get it in three weeks or in one month? Like how many times will people have to, to come back and say, okay, now I'm ready. Like, I don't want us to say, well, you know, sorry, you said no once you're out. That we need to understand that that saying no is our fault. And by our, I mean, institutions that have historically harmed so many uh, Americans. Thank you. Um, this next question is for, for whoever on the panel may be best able to answer this. Are there, are there any medical conditions that may affect or prohibit you from taking the vaccine? Do things like blood type matter or the medications that you take? And what about immunocompromised people or people planning to become pregnant? A lot of categories in, um, in that question and so many important uh, concerns that are raised. Um, so the, you know, the major reasons not to take it are very small. Um, so one is if you've had a severe reaction to an mRNA vaccine before, which is very unusual because it would be small clinical trial. Um, the other would be a severe reaction, allergic reaction to PEG, PEG um, polyethylene glycol, and a review from our hospital system, uh, Mass General Brigham, for 1.2 million patients found that that allergy is 300, 300 and 1.2 million. So very, very rare. So that would be a rare reason. That this substance PEG, which is in the um, injection is very similar material with that's in a colonoscopy preparation or what you might get for a steroid injection into the joint. So very common. Um, so that's really the um, two absolute um, criteria not to get it. And then as medical societies, we're all figuring out in individual decisions with patients, particularly, you know, oncology patients, patients who have immunocompromised, there's no absolute reason not for them not to take it, but it's not, not clear how strong the immune response will be to the vaccine. And that would, would be the case, not just for the COVID vaccine, but vaccines in general in that population. And then you raise the question about pregnancy and breastfeeding. And so pregnant women weren't included in the trial. I'm sure Dr. You know, Dr. Chandler mentioned that. 
Um, that's very common in a lot of treatment studies because of the risk benefit of what might happen both to mom and baby. And what the, um, the Obstetrics and Gynecology Society recommends is a decision between the obstetrician and um, the pregnant mom. And so what we know from how the vaccine works would be very unlikely to have a maleffect. The um, mRNA vaccines were studied in animals early on and in the pregnant animals, there was no evidence of problem with the fetus. But again, it's something we have to be straightforward. We don't know. And so while we, we say that there's a very low risk by how we know the vaccine works, um, very low risk to the fetus, um, for individuals who are, as all of you are, on the front line, the risk of COVID infection is much greater. Um, so that why, that's why um, many of us would support um, uh, pregnant women to get vaccinated. But it is so important to have that conversation, individual conversation with your provider. There's no substitution because it also helps, as patients, us feel confident about the decision. Thank you for that. And um, this next question is for Dr. Bittinger. Um, what does emergency use authorization status mean? It's a great question. Uh, it is a designation from the Food and Drug Administration, the FDA, which is the part of the government that approves uh, medications and therapies. Um, there are two ways uh, that an, a medication or therapy can uh, be used uh, in the US. One is a full approval, which is the normal process, uh, and the other is an emergency use authorization. Um, if the federal government determines that there is a, a need, an emergency, and as Dr. Santiago said, there's really no greater health emergency than the one that we're facing with COVID, um, then the federal government can issue an, an emergency use authorization, uh, which allows the, the uh, therapeutic to be used sooner. It's been used for other uh, therapeutics uh, to treat COVID before the vaccine. What I think is most important to understand about an emergency use authorization or an EUA is that the bar for safety is no different with an EUA than it is for, for, for full approval. So there are no corners cut, there's no tolerance of more risk for, for patients who would get it. Um, we don't know as much about efficacy, and I think Dr. Levison mentioned, the threshold to approve uh, or to give an emergency use authorization for a vaccine was set at 50%, which might be lower than we would normally look at for a vaccine. Well, it turns out that these both of these vaccines, as we've said already, are 94, 95% effective. So that's great. That was well, well above the bar that was set, about the threshold that was set for the EUA. But really, really important to understand that an EUA does not mean corners are cut in safety. It just means that we need it soon and we'd be tolerating a little bit of benefit. Turns out we got really lucky and got a lot of benefit. A uh, question now for uh, Dr. Chandler. Um, how long does the vaccine protection last? Uh, like the flu, will we have to take it every season or every time there's a new strain? What's the-, the Right, time? so, I mean, we don't have great data, but some data that's coming out because the phase three trial, which was the big one with over, you know, about 30,000 individuals, that was our biggest trial. And that, you know, follow the people from July until now. And it seems, and there's also data from the phase two, data from the phase two trial suggests that we might have immunity for about a year. Now, this is all still preliminary. Um, right now, we know that at least six to seven months, but probably at least a year. That's what the preliminary data suggest. Thank you. And this next question is for Dr. Levison. Uh, we are, we're hearing about new strains of the virus. One, what are they? Um, will the vaccine work on them now? And what about new strains that will occur in the future? Hmm. Viruses, reproduce very quickly. And so it's common that we would see um, different strains come up, just like in bacteria and in HIV, for example, it's something that's not surprising. Um, this variant that individuals might have heard, this B1.17, um, we, as of yesterday, when I last checked, there were no cases in Massachusetts, but we can expect that um, since COVID is rapidly spreading, 
um, that there will be a variant. But what does that really mean for us? It means that we need to continue not only to, to really to do the prevention and also support individuals so that they can do the prevention. So I, I um, being able to, I think we all are in agreement that being able to socially distance and wear a mask and have um, stay home is a luxury. And so I really put the onus on our society to help people prevent, but that's really what what I think um, is the big implication that there's greater, we think greater transmissibility with this variant. Um, as we, at least as maybe Dr. Chandler can comment, the understanding is that the vaccine should work. This is a, a, a variant at the level of the spike protein on the receptor of the cell. Exactly, that's the thinking now that it has not altered the receptor enough to prevent it from you know, generating antibodies that will prevent the virus from infecting cells. And that's the other reason that we wanna make sure that people are getting vaccinated because the more this virus replicates and, and is transmitted to the people, the more likely the virus is to make an error when it's replicating, it's, it, that's when the errors occur with replication, meaning when it's transmitted to someone else, it replicates, it multiplies. So vaccination can help stop the spread. And that, along with, of course, physical distancing, wearing a face mask and hand washing. Great, thank you. Um, for Dr. Linos and Dr. Santiago, uh, what, what could the impact on our communities and our health system be if not enough people uh, get the vaccine at the right time? I'll defer to Dr. Santiago, but the biggest problem right now is that we're in the middle of a real surge in Massachusetts and across the country, across the world. Um, my parents live in Greece. Uh, you know, we're seeing it in Europe. We're seeing it in many places. And the the risk is that if not enough people, you know, the 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 promise of this vaccine is that if you get it, even if you were exposed to COVID, you won't either get COVID or it won't be serious enough to land you in the ICU. I mean, I think Dr. Santiago can speak to the fears that a lot of the frontline healthcare workers have. So one is if enough people don't get it, we might reach capacity sooner. The other bigger question is if we never get to herd immunity, our lives can't go, there is no back to normal, but can't resume. Um, and so it is, you know, the reality is for public health professionals, we know that we can't open up our economy safely unless we have some measures. And I saw in one of the questions that somebody asked, you know, did the vaccine come to market too quickly? Is there a, a political agenda? I think we should celebrate how much work scientists across the world were able to put in and recognize that it's not a political agenda. We are in the middle of a real crisis. People are dying every day. And so this vaccine is appropriately coming to, to, to all of us. But Dr. Santiago, I don't know if you disagree. No, I, I would agree um, wholeheartedly with what Dr. Linus was saying. I mean, we are you know, quite literally in the fight of our lives. Here we are 10 months into this pandemic and um, the, the healthcare system is strained. I mean, during the first surge, that was done very acutely. It was very difficult. It was very challenging. People were getting sick on the front lines. And here we are, second surge, and you know people are still scared. Uh, people are still worried. Uh, people are tired. And the only way that we're going to see any light at the end of the tunnel, and that tunnel may be long, but we're in the tunnel, is if we get vaccinated. If we you know begin to you know get our appointments for vaccination, but make sure that we're still hand washing, uh, you know, uh, wearing our mask and doing what we can to protect each other. Uh, because uh, with, as with Dr. Levinson was saying, there is a new variant. Uh, I would expect the variant is already here in Massachusetts. Some suggest that in a matter of months, this could be the dominant strain across the country. Now, it sounds like the vaccine is more than able to address it, but um, the healthcare workforce is still on the front line. I mean, we are tired and, um, and we just need everyone to you know, fight for just a little bit longer, hunker down as we get through these very difficult months. And as Dr. Lino said, I mean, across the country, I mean, I think just last week we had, you know, upwards of 4,000 deaths per day. Um, last week, I think we had 7,000 infections uh, a day in Massachusetts a couple of days. So it's going to be a rough four to six weeks as we move forward. But my hope is that uh, we get folks to vaccinate as quick as possible and that we hunker down here for what's going to be a, a difficult next couple of months. And the next question is for Dr. Bittinger. Um, where, how, where or how will the general public be able to receive the vaccine? 
So uh, the state is currently planning on a number of different strategies, uh, trying to make it as easy as possible for people to get the vaccine uh, as we get more and more supply. Uh, obviously, uh, primary care doctors' offices uh, will be a common site of vaccination. Commercial pharmacies like CVS or Walgreens or others uh, will definitely be uh, another site. Community health centers are a really important uh, part of our vaccination campaign, especially in vulnerable communities. They're so connected to the health of their communities. Uh, and then there probably will be larger sites as well. So several town health departments across the state, uh, more than 70 of them right now actually, uh, are standing up vaccination uh, sites that first are targeted at these phase one groups, but soon uh, we hope to vaccinate the public. Uh, and then you may have seen there are a couple of large venues that are being mobilized. The uh, Gillette Stadium was just used today for the first time for first responders. And uh, right now there's talk of, of turning that into a very large scale venue. So, so a whole host of, variety of ways to do it, whether it's your doctor, your pharmacy, a community health center, others. Um, but but it, again, it, it speaks to how important it is that we're just, it put, it's all hands on deck to get the vaccine out into the community. And that's clearly why the Patriots didn't make the playoffs so we could use Gillette Stadium. Yep. <laughs> that's maybe the only silver lining of this. <laughs> uh, for any of the doctors, um, what, what about children? I know that we talked about the, 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 the trials and who was tested. Uh, is it safe for them to get the vaccine? So I mentioned that the Moderna um, vaccine is currently under study for ages 12 to 17. So I think we'll have more information um, down the road without that information. I think, um, you know, we're in a data-free zone. I don't know, Paulette, if you have any other recommendations about kids. I, they have a study going on about 3,000 kids, so we'll have data. I mean, we have the Pfizer, which did vaccinate up to, you know, age 16. So it probably will be safe for kids. And we know that in women that became pregnant while they were in the trial, there were no, you know, lot fetal, there weren't any um, complications in the pregnancy. So... And also women that have developed COVID in infection during their pregnancy, we're not seeing you know, increased risk of fetal loss or complications during the pregnancy. So that's some suggestion that it may be safe, but we need the data. Thank you. And this is, this is our final question of the night. Um, what message do, do you have, and this is for everyone, for each of you, uh, what message do you have for anyone who is afraid to take the vaccine? I'll start, but I bet you we all have comments about it. Uh, I, I would say it, it's okay to have questions uh, and you should ask questions. And hopefully we've, we've done a little bit of uh, help uh, for folks getting answers tonight, but, but ask questions to, to get the reassurance you need. Um, but, but we want you to get the vaccine. I, I have complete confidence in the safety and efficacy of the vaccine. Uh, I saw a question um, uh, in, in the chat that uh, was asking when life will get back to normal. And we, we need as many of us as possible to get vaccinated to, to get the vaccine, or sorry, to get the virus out of the community, uh, to decrease the circulating levels of COVID and to protect us all. Uh, and only as we all participate uh, in this and, and get vaccinated and protect ourselves and our families and our communities, do we have uh, that, that hope of getting back to that normal life that we're all uh, so eager to get to. And I, I would just say that the stakes are high. I mean, we are having over 4,000 deaths a day. And don't think of that death as just someone else because that could be someone in your community. And also the risk overall as one, guy that decided to participate in the Moderna trial, he said, I want to be part of the solution rather than be in a coffin and have someone, you know, putting nails in my coffin. So it's, of course, I've seen the comments. We don't know the long-term effects. We don't, we don't, but we also don't know the long-term effects of having this virus continue to circulate, mutate, and cause wreak havoc in our lives. So there's uncertainty on both, both hands, on both angles. So I encourage people that are still concerned about the risk and the um, concern about the harm that it may cause them, continue to gather information, continue to discuss it with your healthcare provider and continue to think about it. Don't 
just stay on the sidelines, but remain engaged with the thought of getting the vaccine, as well as engaging in the other public health strategies, wearing a mask, physical distancing, hand washing, and engaging in contact tracing if you're um, reached out to by someone in, you know, that's doing contact tracing. I would add to that that um, having questions is, re is really Im important. Um, I think uh, we all want, as providers, we want our, our patients and communities to feel comfortable about what they're getting. And so um, feeling like you've had your questions adequately answered are super important. At the same time, we're also learning from our communities about what's important and that exchange is, is critical. Um, and this is really, a, it's, a, it's like a family and community affair. I mean, we, I think to speak to Dr. Linos, we won't all be safe until every single person is safe. And our whole future is really mutually dependent. We're dependent on one another in a very, um, uh, though the risks are unequal, we are dependent on one another. So I think continue to educate yourself from your providers, your public health organizations, um, the local religious organizations as sort of trusted, trusted sources that are gonna help you balance the risks and benefits. And, and of course your community health centers, we stand by you and we're always ready to help answer with questions. With answers. And I'm happy to add here that the, you know, the notion that you might be hesitant, you know, I, I understand that, but you're also in a real lucky place. I am dealing right now with, you know, my husband's immigrant parents who are elderly, they're 78, very sick in Michigan, and, you know, not sick, they have had many comorbidities and not knowing how to get them a vaccine. So recognizing that you are in a lucky place if you're being offered. I don't know when I'll be offered it as a public health worker. I'm not a frontline worker. I am able to continue socially distancing. So recognize that you do have a chance to say yes when a lot of people are trying to figure out ways to, to sort of game the system, to buy vaccines, to cut in line. So while we've talked a lot about you know hesitancy, we also need to recognize that there are so many people who are eager, 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 and they're eager because they know that the vaccine, the, they trust the scientists, they know that although we don't know the long-term side effects, as Dr. Chandler said, we also have a lot of indications that there are long-term side effects of having COVID. Whether you survive it, whether you have a mild case, you, you might have long-term side effects. And so the trade-off is pretty clear in my mind. So the minute I'm offered it, I will take it. Um, and I hope that many of you will come out of here feeling that, you know, what are the trade-offs? I am on the front lines. I am doing this work. I am at risk because the public health, you know, data is showing that it's surging and I need to do what's best. And, you know, I speak to your friends and speak to your doctors. I'll just add that, look, uh, times are scary. Um, I myself have, uh, a level of anxiety, stress um, that's been going on for months. You know, whether it's during the first surge, you know, undressing myself before I go into my house just to not infect my partner potentially. And I see it every single day when I walk in the emergency department and it's scary. And it's not just about whether we're infected with COVID-19, but it's impacted our life. Whether we've you know, lost a home or a job, and it's really just wrapped in society. But I'm gonna let you know that as an elected official, as a person of color and as a physician, I would not ask you to do something that I wouldn't do. I went there, I took both shots, and aside from some chills and a sore arm for a couple of days, I did it. I did my duty. And I think, you know, there's a lot of hesitancy out there in, in communities of color, um, but over the next couple of months, um, you're gonna see me, you're gonna see and a whole host of doctors and teammates out there, really making sure that, that those most vulnerable have access to this vaccine and are gonna get it. And so the next couple of months, are, are, it's, it's going to be very consequential in, ter in terms of what the virus is doing to our, to our communities. And so uh, 509, I just thank you for this opportunity to share these experiences and this education with your members. Um, you guys do so much work. You're on the front lines. You are literally quite, you know, it's a team game, right? You know, it's not just the emergency room doctor. It's not the folks and, and the epidemiologists. It's, it's, we're all in this together. And I think the sooner we can get vaccinated, the sooner we can help each other, the sooner we can get out of this. Uh, COVID-19 madness. So thank you again. And I, I look forward to uh, seeing you next time. Great. Thank you so much. I want to thank our panel. Sincere thanks and appreciation to our panel for, for joining us, for giving us your expert uh, insight into this. Um, truly, truly appreciative. Uh, this is really helpful for those who are on the, on the call. We have recorded this. This was out on Facebook Live, so it's available. 
uh, for your coworkers, your colleagues, your friends who weren't able to join us tonight, please share it. We will get it out to our members. For the questions that we weren't able to get to, we have been tracking them. We have an FAQ that's been developed with uh, the Chief Medical Officer of SEIU 1199 uh, that we will add to from this conversation. We will continue to get information out um, and, and to give the best information that we can to our members so that people with advice of their own medical professionals and their doctors can make decisions about what's best for them. But sincere gratitude and appreciation to all of you for joining us uh, tonight. And Orlando, I don't know if you want to wrap it up and take us out. No, I don't have much to say, but thank you all for, for joining us today. This was great. You know, the feedback we've been getting, even through text, is, has, been, has been great. The questions were great. Thank you all. Uh, we really appreciate it. Absolutely. And it's really going to help my co me and my peers and my coworkers sort of uh, hopefully um, get vaccinated as soon as possible and protect themselves and also their families. So thank you. Thank you all. And with that, we're at the end of our hour. Um, thanks for joining us and uh, stay safe, everybody.